we're going to be talking about predicting urban heat islands at Calgary in the city of Canada, uh, the city in Canada. But let me first do a bit of introduction. Uh, there are two of us who are going to be giving this talk. The first is myself. I'm Anand. I'm CEO and co-founder at Garamaru, a data science company. And along with me, who uh, is Sumed, who's a senior data scientist, and he'll be taking over the second half of the talk where we talk about what it is that we exactly did. But let me first tell you a bit about the context. What exactly is the need to predict heat islands and how Python can help with that and what we did in that space. The yeah, heat island is when a portion of the city is much warmer than the nearby areas. Typically, in urban areas, we have higher heat absorption and higher heat retention. That's one of the reasons it gets hotter. There's also a transpiration from plants, which can cool the environment, and water evaporation from the soil, which can cool the environment, both of which are absent when there's more concrete on the ground. Water penetration is also impacted because of that. There's a whole lot less water in the surface soil than in rural areas. So the net impact is that an urban area is a whole lot hotter than a rural area. This is something that can cause well, deaths, literally. So in 2021, Calgary estimated that there were as many 66 deaths that were directly traceable to heat waves and urban heat. And this is not uncommon. This is something that has been increasing over the years in the city of Calgary. Heat waves are one part of the problem. Human health and safety is another part of the problem. But services, public services in general, get disrupted. I must say, what we want to do is understand how we are contributing to this and what interventions can we make to reduce this problem. Now, what is it that they can do? Well, one thing that they can do is grow more trees and vegetation. That lowers the air temperature because of the shade and the evaporation. It also reduces the amount of storm water runoff, so there's going to be more water underground. Green roofs help. That reduces the roof and air temperature, so the surface is cool as well as the air is cool. Uh, cool roofs as well. Cool roofs are different from green roofs in the sense that they're more reflective, so they take temperature away from the building, and that reduces the temperature below the roofs. Pavements can also be designed to be cool pavements that reflect more, that allow more evaporation. And all of these also improve the water that's below the surface. And that apart, the, uh, the government has a series of options to spend the budget in smarter ways and improve the overall strategy. But the, the thing is, every single one of these, it requires a budget. It requires a certain amount of effort. And doing this for the entire city is actually a bit hard. So their question was really this. I want to know to a 100 meter by 100 meter granularity, if you could. Where exactly is the highest risk so that we can take more focused action? And this means that the prediction needs to be at a whole lot more granular level than just taking the overall satellite data. Now, the good part is the data is available. Landsat 8, and we'll talk a little more about it, provides land surface temperature across the globe every 15 days. Landsat 8 is a satellite that has a series of sensors, and one of the sensors is the thermal sensor. Now, what we can do is look not just at the temperature data, but data about the buildings, about the vegetation, about a whole series of other things at that granularity and use that to predict whether in a particular region, the temperature in the next year, few years is going to rise, fall, effectively doing the equivalent of the regression, except doing it spatially. And this is in fact what we did. And we're able to explain as much as 70% of the variability in the land surface temperature. This talk is really about how we went about doing that. First, I'm going to explain the kind of data that we got. And secondly, 
I'm going to talk about and be passing over to Sumit for the second half of the presentation to talk about how exactly we model this. So the first part is understanding where exactly the heat waves are for which we need this temperature data and what exactly is causing it. Landsat 8 provides temperature data and this is through a thermal infrared sensor. This is something that can be used to map at a pretty fine level what the temperature for any particular uh, region is at 100 meter by 100 meter grid. So, for example, this is what it looks like in August 2014. The land, uh, the land surface temperature uh, is not too bad. You can see that it's relatively cool at this point. Uh, however, in 2019, you can see that it's a whole lot warmer. In just five years, the temperature has increased by as much as six to seven percent, as is six to seven degrees. That, that's quite a bit. You look at the temperature changes that have happened year on year. From 2014 to 2015 was a reasonably big shift, and from 2015 to 2016 was just as big a shift. From there on, it's been fairly stable. However, it's not like all of the regions have been heating up uniformly. In fact, from 2018 to 2019, you can see that some regions near the river have actually cooled down a fair bit. Some regions cooled down in 2018. Now, it's important to understand what exactly happened as part of these local changes that the government can make use of and also see which are the variables that, uh, which of the variables have an impact. Here are some of the variables that we do have in the environment. So specifically, we can use the normal difference vegetation index that effectively talks about how much coverage there is in any particular region. The second is the surface water body, how much water is there in a particular region. That's a factor that can affect the temperature. The third is albedo. Does the surface reflect solar energy or does it not? Or how much does it reflect? And these are things that we can extract from the satellite image. But there are some pieces of information we can't quite extract from here, like the population, which is something that we need to provide uh, external information for. Then there's also information such as the normal difference built-up index. What I mean by the normal difference built-up index is the areas where there is more construction versus less construction, effectively the uh, urban infrastructure. Also, the urban sprawl, that is how well dispersed are they? What I mean by dispersed is are all the buildings clustered together, which has different temperature characteristics, versus are they spread out more? The building count, which is what is the total number of buildings in a certain area, the site coverage, and a whole series of these parameters. Now, these are the parameters that we use to build the model. And what we're going to do now, and specifically I'll hand over to Sumit for this, is to show how exactly we modeled this particular scenario. Let me stop sharing my screen. Let me just share my screen, but the next part, okay, we, we do have Sumit on. Sumit, could you share your screen? Yes, uh, can I see the screen? Yes, it's coming. Yeah, yes. so uh, the next part, the major part, sorry, let me uh, cut off in between the two summation. Uh, so the main part is how uh, did we model it? Um, we, uh, the entire model was built on a Python library and uh, those are specific geospatial related libraries. Uh, so this was the in general flow. Uh, I will just scheme you through different different sections that code uh, takes us through. Uh, one is uh, what are the different types of data sets that we are taking? One, uh, as Anand mentioned, uh, we are taking Landsat 30 meter data set. Landsat data set provides us with thermal bands, which are uh, very good in terms of identifying the thermal temperatures uh, of the particular object. The other data set that we are looking at is infrastructure data set. These data sets are basically with respect to building infrastructure. How many number of buildings are there? What is the height of the building? What is the parcel area of the building? The third is more of a demographic data. 
like population in a particular community for that uh, Calgary area. So we did some three major steps. One is data processing, data aggregation, and feature engineering. These are the like most common steps to be uh, you know uh, done while going for any particular machine learning or special machine learning algorithms. Uh, what we did in data processing is. The raw data set was not enough. We calculated different different indices from the satellite imagery data. We also calculated urban morphological variables, which includes, say, uh, floor area ratio, building block coverage. All of these uh, particular uh, matrices will come later while I scheme you through the code. Uh, the data was aggregated at a grid level. So we wanted to have information at, say, 100 meter grid. So we wanted to zonal stack like do aggregation of all of these particular data sets into one grid so one grid will have the temperature value in value building block coverage building related detail value and some feature engineering so after doing all of this we found out which are the features that are you know affecting the land surface temperature more and we kept only those now one of the major method that is used for identification or prediction of land surface temperature was spatial regression. Uh, this we have like again performed on 100 meter grid level. The type of spatial regression that we had used is spatial regression with fixed effects. Uh, in the bottom, you will find like these, what are the particular, uh, you know, data processing that we have done. Uh, in terms of say Landsat, the data was available at a particular timestamp and we, you know, uh, resampled it to 100 meter grid while doing zonal statistics and aggregation. Uh, zonal statistics is a method where in which you give a zone to a particular entity and it aggregates information about all of uh, all the entities for that particular zone. And third is uh, spatial modeling. Uh, as I told, like uh, the year from which Landsat dataset is available is 2013. But unfortunately, we do didn't got good uh, coverage in terms of cloud. So we took data from 2014 to 2020. Uh, to the point, Landsat data set is available at every 15 days interval. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, these are, uh, I will not go into detail about these particular uh, processes about how do we calculate the land surface temperature, uh, but these are derived from Landsat uh, handbook, uh, which is also present on USGS website. We have also mentioned these particular sources into the Git uh, repository, which is into chat box. Uh, with respect to this, uh, there are some pre-processing like atmospheric spherical radiance, brightness, temperature, calculation of proportion of vegetation and emissivity, the product of which gives us the overall land surface temperature of that particular area. It also gives us what is the vegetation in that particular area and also gives us parameter like is that area impervious or pervious in surface nature because Landsat provides different different bands which are uh, uh, sensitive to specific particular feature on the Earth's surface. Uh, this I have uh, already mentioned, but two details for this, like uh, I will just read the main major block. Zonal statistics is one of the major method and it's a time taking method because say for cities like Calgary or any bigger cities, uh, we'll have large number of grids. So since these grid are 100 by 100 meter grids, over if we, if we span those grids across the city, uh, th those are kind of more than uh, nine, 900,000 uh, rows. And for all of these rules, we need to get the statistics of each and every parameter which is present on the earth. So zonal statistics is one of the uh, main method which is used. And for spatial merging of the data sets, we are taking into consideration the geospatial Python libraries, which can join the features on the basis of geometry. So each bounding box that you take will have one geometry, whatever that falls into that geometry or intersect with the geometry, will be taken into uh, that geometries column. So in that sense, we created an entire table, which gives us, uh, you know, uh, rows as well as columns, which are say dependent and independent variables. Uh, so these were the basic results. These results will came uh, will come uh, while we are skimming through the code as well. 
both special regression and uh, regression with fixed effects are two types. So normal uh, ordinary least square regression, if we do, we get to see that there are not much good results, but we uh, add the parameters of special effects like communities, uh, which are present over their community boundaries into the data set. Uh, we get to see that uh, the explainability of the model or R square value of the model has, uh, has been good as compared to above two methods. And the in general R square value that we got was around say, 75 to uh, uh, like 71%, uh, that, that is 0 0.71. Uh, this is the normal special regression formula. It's like same like any regression formulas, but we are taking an extra parameter as constant of the community. Uh, so uh, this is regarding the main uh, stuff that how we did it, but let me skim you through the code uh, factors of this particular uh, this particular model. Uh, Anant, can you check if you can see the uh, coding sheet, please? Yes, it will. Cool. Uh, so I have given this particular link uh, in the chat box, which consists of where we have kept the data. When you go into the uh, that particular folder, you will find that uh, there are number of files that are being used to process this data set. You can download this and try it on your, your own. Uh, for uh, the satellite data purpose, we have added the links from where we have taken the satellite data. It's a manual download process uh, that we have to follow. And since satellite data sets are quite huge, uh, we have not kept it uh, into, into the folder, the respective folder. But irrespective of that, like irrespective of one notebook, you can run uh, the other type of other parts of the notebook, including uh, those, the, the data which is mentioned. So the step one of uh, this particular modeling process was to understand how do we calculate land surface temperature satellite related indices for which we are using different types of uh, geospatial libraries as well as normal Python uh, libraries such as pandas, math library, um, JSON libraries. Uh, what we generally do is uh, we need to have data at certain resolution. Uh, in special sense, it, it is at zoom level, so we kept a zoom particular level. Now we get to know what is the particular boundary as Anand showed in the previous slide, what was the exact boundary for which we want to calculate and clip the satellite data to. So we just want uh, land surface temperature and other parameters for this particular boundary. Uh, we try to see uh, how many TIFF files we have downloaded that, that you can download through the USGS given site. So once you download the TIFF, you will find it in this manner. So one particular TIFF file will have these number of bands. Now the main process is uh, I have to clip all of those files with respect to the area of interest that is Calgary. Uh, this process helps to uh, you know uh, go pathwise, clip that data and save that data with a particular band name and uh, you know selected nomenclature. Like anyone can decide their own nomenclature. We repeat the same process and uh, we give the, uh, like we select that particular data set, we clip that data set and we give the nomenclature wise name. So this is how the processing looks like. It goes to it, each particular TIFF file and it tries to clip it. Now, once we have clipped, you can just check for which particular months it has run. So it has run for 2013, third month and 22nd date and so on. Uh, one of the major parameter while uh, talking through the uh, like satellite related indices, we, we need to have the metadata of the file, which includes factors like uh, radians, uh, reflectance, as well as sun angles, etc. cetera. Uh, that we get from the metadata of the file. We are just iterating, iterating over that file and grabbing the information which is necessary for us. Uh, we are also uh, uh, attaching a config file uh, which which tells us which particular uh, bands which are being used uh, for this particular processing. You will find the config file in this, uh, in the data set part. Uh, the third, uh, third thing is 
any satellite data has coordinate reference system we are setting uh, the coordinate reference system to the metric system the local system uh, now that comes the process wherein which we are extracting the parameters from the metadata and we are calculating the land surface temperature so all of these calculation are mentioned in the ppt which is given these this is the step by step uh, functioning of all the mathematical calculations which are written into ppt i will not go detail into this <clears throat> so with this we are calculating ndvi ndbi whatever the vegetation fraction uh, water differences uh, as well as albedo emissivity and finally land surface temperature uh, this particular file will individually get saved by their individual names and the date format which we have extracted so uh, this file will have say for example 2013 third month 22 uh, calgary ndbr if file so once we have all of this stiff file saved we want to convert it into the grid manner as we we have spoken together so uh, this is one of the function which takes individual file and convert it into a grid format and saves it with respect to the zoom level that we have selected now once we have you know created those particular grids i will show you how that how those grids uh, grids will look like once we have the grid information we need to attach uh, the demographic data the ward wise population data uh, community wise data sets community wise boundaries so we are again doing the special join method the method which i uh, which we spoken into the ppt and applying it on the ward data set as well as community data set so for each particular uh, uh, date we we will have all of this in lst ndvi mndw all the parameters with wards and community adjusted we save these particular files to uh, geojson because those are geospatially enabled files now the step second and third are more of arranging those particular parameters into sequential manner uh, these particular uh, files doesn't require like uh, i will spend time on this if like if, if there is a any particular specific time required but just to scheme through since we have data set in the horizontal manner just like this we want to make it in a systematic manner uh, and these are and add the time uh, variable into that so uh, step number 1 add time to grids add attributes to grids and merge to merge attribute to grids only talk about how we can get this data into systematic manner uh, these are like sequential operations one after the other but not any uh, major particular operation is done on this like any special regression or application as such uh, these particular two or three notebooks help to uh, get this data into uh, say this man so we have geometry we have the structure id we have the building height and other parameters included into that so it what was the uh, date when that particular uh, that particular building was set up what is the area what is the floor number and all that now after having it into this manner we want to add additional parameters which are processed afterwards so after we have graded information there are still two or three features which are which needs to be calculated one we wanted to see in terms of temperature if high uh, agglomerated building areas have high temperature for which we need to calculate one uh, indices that is known as shannon's entropy indices uh, how do we calculate it is <clears throat> with respect to with respect to each and every grid so e from each and every grid we see if there are any uh, number of buildings that can be grouped together and give one entropy value for each um, and what we get to see is uh, it's a, a unitless quantity shannon's entropy is a unitless quantity which which generally uh, varies from 0 uh, and towards 1 so when we say towards one towards one is very highly compacted areas and if it is near to zero those are sparsely compacted areas so in calgary we saw that like only for uh, only 
for downtown area there is high agglomeration but most of the regions in calgary are sparsely agglomerated so they don't have high number of houses in the small uh, area we also calculated building block coverage so how much area of a particular building is included into each and every grid so if there are two to three fill buildings falling into uh, one grid what is the total building block coverage that it has so that we get to know how much area is covered in terms of land pass so these are the two indices we can only calculate once we have grid in place because we want to calculate on the grid basis now comes the last uh, now comes the last step uh, where in which we are consolidating all of these data sets together and calculating a special regression on that so whatever the steps that we have saved earlier we are reading the same files again i have added these files directly also into the uh, the data ar archival that we have so if anyone wants to you know run only special regression on their data sets they can just follow this particular specific notebook they don't have to calculate the previous steps as well so now once we load the community data in first step we just had included the boundary of the data set now just like this the first step we just had boundary because we wanted to clip the landsat imagery now we want to include how, what is happening inside different different communities in order to understand the special autocorrelation between them so this is just reading the heads checking how the column looks like for each and every Right. Now we select a uh, particular uh, uh, column names, which are kind of uh, variables that will be used into a regression formula. So, unlike year or unlike geometry parameters, we need to use only those parameters which make sense to go into a regression. So, just like this, we select those particular parameters, and we fit model it into first is nearest neighbor. second is uh, ordinary least square regression third is special regression and fourth is special regression with fixed effects now special regression with fixed effects uses uh, k nearest neighbors because it, try, it tends to check how many nearby uh, grids that it need, needs to be correlated with so if you take a you know 3 by 3 grid if you leave the central grid you will find like rest eight grids uh having impact on the middle grid generally so we have taken k as a uh, uh, number of uh, nearest neighbors that we get to say now once we apply this we try to apply this through overall years like from 2013 to 2021 now we wanted to visualize how does it look like so once you see this so since satellite imagery was not available in 13 we don't have much good data but if you see the land surface temperature ranges for each and every year uh, and how it is changing so most of the times we get to see some of the hot spots which are always there like this particular middle part has been repeated many a times so uh, once we have land surface temperature and we see it with the community wise so for 2013 what was the temperature for that particular community name or the boundary area similarly we do it for all the regions 13 didn't had much data set so we consider it from 14 and onwards we merge it with the community data set once again now this is the comparison of r square which which was again shown into the PP, uh, ppt so what we found out was like on an average it was giving us around 0.71% accuracy in terms of explaining the variability of different different uh, indices that we have taken or parameters that we have considered with respect to land surface temperature uh now in the formula i have mentioned about the community constant so each community will have its own value so we are not considering 13 and considering from 14 to 2020 each community goes with particular uh uh like temperature factor right we divide that with number of years and we get to know what is the community constant for that specific community which which will look something like this 
so for this particular community from 14 onwards uh this was the community constant temperature that was derived now uh this is just like kind of uh, pre processing and checking how those particular communities and constant look like we are also taking average constant so once we find out the variables which are needed we try to find out what is the average constant for each and every variable so that we get to see if the ndvi value is varying in this particular manner what should be the average uh, you know uh, average pattern that it should follow generally now once we uh, have all of this if required we can also apply the robust scalar for normalization but we found out that this results are even like uh, in the similar manner without applying robust scalar to so this is application of both you can just uh, run through these particular notebooks just to get the feel of it now let's uh, take one particular specific community and perform on that so we we took one particular community as greenview industrial park this is how it looks like and we applied all the variable constant that was generated what we get to see is the uh, predicted temperature which is say the land surface temperature for that year was uh, 21.71 but model predicted it as 24.17 so this changes with respect to each and every and this is the difference like what is the exact different uh, difference that it was uh, it was giving us so generally when we took uh, you know what is the mean difference that we have got for all of these particular grids it was coming around say uh, 2.2 raised to minus 10 uh, logarithmic so in general it was giving kind of good results as per the explainability was r square value was minus uh, uh, sorry r square value was 0.72 we save those particular results with respect to the um, specific value again so that we can visualize it on any specific platform at such uh this is uh one of the main matter uh uh anyone have any questions please okay thanks to the guys gramanier for their very in-depth talk um a round of applause please <laughs> we have time for some questions um if you want to ask one in person please step up to the mic yes hello um thank you very much for that talk uh, the level of detail was great um, i think it'd be good for a tutorial as well um so i'm just interested to know um what are the worst uh, case scenarios around the world that you found with the um, with your data explorations and can this be used for uh, non urban heat island effects uh, can you still hear us in on the remote and technical difficulties. Or well, given the time difference, it looks like it was. <laughs> What's happening? Can we give that a, another go? Okay, let's try again, uh, if you can repeat exactly. <laughs> uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, it looks like everyone's gone. Um, anyway, I'll just to repeat my question. Um, so what are the worst case scenarios around the world that you found today or that you predict in the next couple of years? And also, can this be used for non-urban environments? Um, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Yes. Uh, just a little question. Like, uh, can you give example about non-urban environment? Like, you mean to say with respect to climate models or something? Like, what? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about say non non-urban developments around the world and changing um, uh, vegetative landscape. Uh, if that makes sense. Definitely. So. Uh, this model can be replicated anywhere where the land set satellite imageries are available. So, uh, Landsat imageries are generally available on land and during the daytime period. Wherever area, uh, whichever area that is, you know, included in the Landsat particular platform around the globe can be included for this type of study. Though urban developments happen at more faster rate than non-urban areas like say vegetation area or ecological areas or something like that, it might not see that much, that much effect on changing land surface temperature because land surface temperature is something related to skin temperature of the object. So if there is a vegetation, it will have skin temperature of the vegetation. If there is water, it will be skin temperature of water. Same way, if it is a terrace surface or say building surface, it will be the building surface temperature. So yes, to answer to use, it can be applied to these particular sectors. Any question that I'm missing right now? Um, also, uh, what are the worst case scenarios around the world that you found today or in the next coming years? So one of the worst case scenarios will be uh, with respect to uh, the soil loss uh, in terms of like soil is losing its particularity and not adhering to different different crop yield productions. That is one. Second thing is uh, the overall climate change, which is happening through urban morphological factors. And th third is rapid deforestation, uh, which might lead to such kind of event in large scale across different parts of the city at the same time. So these are the main, major threats. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Do we have any remote questions? No. Um, maybe I have one question. Um, why did you choose Calgary? And um, you know, these are kind of anomalous areas that showed up in the trends. Uh, were you able to explain those and, and maybe make use of that information? Yes. So out of which we have created one application, uh, which is a scenario modeling for uh, like areas like Calgary uh, or regions in Canada, which faced uh, mass he, uh, heat rises in some of the months and that caused deaths. So what they are primarily doing is uh, going towards sustainability development. Now, once you get to know at which particular pocket you have what type of urban heat island, uh, then you can do actions on the basis of that. So this is giving insights, uh, actionable insights, which they can directly work on and they will exactly know which particular location or which particular grid I should work on to, like the geographic location to improve it. So as the new satellite comes in, satellite imageries comes in, they can also monitor uh, what are the positive or negative changes of whatever that action that has been taken on the ground. So yes. Was it, is there a concrete example you can give us of something actionable from this city? So uh, city right now are like, say for one of the major uh, uh, thing that we got from this exercise was building height is, uh, was helping into uh, reducing some of the urban heat and effects because the height of the building was throwing the shadows on the respective areas with respect to the sun angles. So for those particular areas where we have massive, uh, you know, big land parcels for um, say, for example, residential and all of that part, generally having high elevated buildings and not largely, you know, wide buildings can help the most. Uh, but this particular um, sections are still in process. So we just have given them the, uh, you know, application, they're working on it, they're checking the different, different hotspots and preparing their climate teams. Okay, thanks. Um, if there are no remote questions, then I think we can finish up and a nice round of applause for our colleagues in India.